<laughs> okay, some folks entering the room now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, give everyone a moment to join. Um, please feel free to, to uh, get in the chat and let us know where you're where you're um, coming in from today. Got folks from New York City, Bluffton, Nebraska, Michigan, wonderful. New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, California. Oof, wonderful. Well, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm your host, Rich Merritt. I'm the Director of Operations of Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York, the state program in the National Audubon Society. Um, we put on these webinars on a monthly basis and uh, Audubon's mission is to protect birds and their habitats in places um, like uh, healthy forests and coasts and where humans are too in bird-friendly communities, which is the subject of today's um, planning for bird-friendly cities that put nature first. Um, I'd just like to know that the webinar is being recorded. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them on the chat. Uh, we will um, try to answer some of them during the presentation, but we also have a question and answer period at the end. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic to uh, my friend Margo Ernst, uh, who is a past board member of the National Audubon Society and Audubon New York, and a current board member of Island Press, which is Tim's, uh, Tim Beatley's publisher. Um, so um, Margo, you may introduce our speaker. Thank you, Rich and Audubon for supporting and organizing this webinar today. Our presenter is Timothy Beatley, the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the last 30 years. Beatley is the author or co-author of more than 15 books, including Green Urbanism, Learning from European Cities, Native to Nowhere, Sustaining Home and Community in a Global Age, and Biophilic Cities, Integrating Nature into Urban Design and Planning. Tim directs the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Tim will be speaking to us about the ideas and findings in his new book, Bird Friendly Cities, Island Press 2020. He will argue that all cities can and must work not only to reduce the dangers to birds, but to design buildings and urban neighborhoods that make room for birds and other biodiversity. We will also hear about the tangible cities, steps that cities are taking on behalf of birds and how bird conservation fits into the global biophilic cities movement. I'm wearing two hats today. I'm so proud of Audubon and Island Press and so thankful to Tim for doing this with us. And I will hand things over to our presenter, Professor Timothy Beatley. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much, Margo. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, today. And um, if I forget to say this, I should say in the beginning that so many of the stories, so many of the things that I'm talking about in the book and you'll see are things that are underway around the country and being being done by Audubon groups. So Audubon's a pretty big deal in the book, and uh, you'll you'll see it as we start to get into some of the some of the stories and some of the different ways we can think about what a what a bird friendly city uh, is. So I'm going to start. I have um, a lot of slides and maybe too many for the time that I have. We'll see, but I'm going to kind of go quickly and start with really two parts to this presentation. The first part is to talk more generally about the role of nature in cities, and in particular, this uh, idea of biophilic uh, cities. And then the second part is really more specifically about the book and about some of the main themes and, and main stories um, contained in the book. So I am an urban planner by training, by background, um, thinking a lot about cities. We're in a, in a time when cities are under a lot of pressure, uh, lots of challenges, and uh, we know that to, to move in the direction of, of sustainability and addressing climate change and creating, creating resilience, um, we believe cities have to be compact. 
and dense. Um, and that's what will be necessary, we think, to reduce carbon emissions, to invest in transit, to create walkable uh, kinds of cities that have small ecological footprints. Um, but the question is, can you have those compact, dense cities, but also lots of nature? And here's the, the cities uh, and nature with the question mark is, the, is a big uh, question for us, but it's not really a question. We argue that you've got to have the urban and the nature together and birds are a really big uh, part of that. So a little bit of the st background story, a little bit of the history, we started a something called the Biofluid Cities Project um, around 2011 uh, here at UVA. Um, this idea of biophilia is really at the core of this, of this vision of cities. Here you have uh, one of E.O. Wilson's definitions. Um, E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard, not the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's coined it in the way that we think of it today. This notion that we, are, uh, we have an innate connection to nature, that we're drawn to nature, that to live uh, fully happy truly happy and healthy lives, meaningful lives, we need nature. And it's not something optional. It, it has to be uh, all around us where we're living and working. It can't just be something that we, we think we're going to get once or twice a year on, on vacation. So that's the heart of the idea, biophilic cities, cities that um, connect us to the natural world, to nature. And there's a lot of evidence. I think probably a lot of you know this. Um, we could spend the whole time talking about the research, about the scholarship. There's something new every week, it seems. But for me, when I think about what it is that uh, affects me, what it is that I'm drawn to, what are the things that are delightful in the world? They are living things. They are uh, flowers and trees and butterflies and, of course, birds. Um, and that's the heart of this, uh, this idea. And the evidence is that when we're uh, around that, that nature, that nature has, that, has, a, has tremendous power to improve our mood, to relax us, to reduce our stress uh, levels. Um, the evidence coming out of Japan around, about, around forest bathing, which is what this article is about, that as you walk through a forest at the end of that walk, uh, you will see your your stress hormone levels go down. That, that walk through the woods boosts your immune uh, system. So, so nature does so many things uh, for us. We're not entirely sure uh, why it is the, the case, um, but we am gonna back up actually. And, um, uh, but there is a, an emerging science of biophilia and uh, some believe that it has a lot to do with the shapes and forms in nature and the frac fractal geometry of things like trees. Um, fractals are the self-repeating shapes and forms. So that leaf is a small version of the bow, which is a smaller, small version of the larger tree. And the belief that we have evolved a visual system to effortlessly process that, those fractals. So, so um, this idea of effortlessly looking uh, at the world and its trees and clouds and birds. Um, here's a quote from Richard Taylor, who chairs the physics department at the University of Oregon, who's done a lot of the work around this idea and what he calls fractal fluency. Humans have fractal fluency. On the left, um, meant to remind me about birdsong. We'll talk a little bit in a little bit more detail later about the importance of birdsong. Uh, but we know that um, we've got hospitals in places like the UK that are recording birdsong and playing it back. At, at especially stressful times for, for patients when children are going into surgery, for, for example, or getting inoculated. And we know that birdsong uh, reaches us in a, in a really deep way and has these therapeutic benefits uh, uh, from nature. And this image actually has to do with a very, uh, very creative way that they are using birdsong uh, to understand hearing loss, um, actually. So there is a science. If we had to sort of summarize what all these benefits, it would be very hard to, to do that. It is very hard to summarize the, the literature, the research coming out of medicine and public health and environmental psychology. Um, I tried to do that in this slide for a, actually for a healthcare uh, conference a while ago. And uh, I tried to get a lot on the, on the screen here. And it is true that just everything on the right is associated with, with nature. So you know, lower depression, lower anxiety, improved mood, 
improved happiness, even evidence that shows that uh, more nature means lower crime, lower gun violence, lower social isolation, even evidence now coming out of psychology that we are more likely to be generous in the presence of nature, more likely to be cooperative, more likely to think longer term. So you can make the argument that having nature around us helps us to be better human beings. And if you had to summarize it, we're often talking about this uh, by using the word flourishing, which I really like a lot. So it's human flourishing, but it's ecological flourishing as well, and flourishing for birds. We will get into that in a, in a minute. And for me, the word flourishing is important because it's, it's, it's certainly uh, pleasure and delight, but it's also meaning and purpose in life. And nature uh, provides that in a way almost uh, nothing else does. So we want nature, we need nature around us uh, in cities. And of course, so many ecological services uh, provided by the nature, lots of reasons why we want to be investing uh, uh, in nature. This is an image from Rotterdam uh, where they have to deal with the management of water um, and just about anything that you can do to make a city more biophilic and natureful, whether that's planting trees or uh, green rooftops uh, will help to make that city resilient. And so cities need to be uh, more resilient, especially in the face of, of climate change. Um, so the image here, second from the left, is this really interesting idea of a water square, a water, water plaza, which is something Rotterdam's been designing and, and building, the idea of having new um, gathering spaces, new public spaces for neighborhoods that need, need that, um, and designing a lot of nature in. But um, also designing it to, to absorb and retain stormwater. So for most of the time, that space is, is something that benefits the community, it's public space, it's basketball courts and, and um, again, nature, uh, but a small percentage of the time it is uh, going to retain stormwater. So there are a lot of reasons, again, for why we need to have nature. And our vision of biophilic cities is one where nature is not something peripheral, it's not secondary, it is a primary uh, design element. Um, so we have a, a network um, of biophilic cities. Um, we started this network really in 2013 and you can join as a partner city. And there, um, if I forget to, to say this, please go and visit our website, biophiliccities.org and a lot of information there about how you join as a partner city, you can join as an individual, uh, just going online and, and uh, signing a pledge and you'll be part of the, the network. But we spend a fair amount of time talking about what it means to be a biophilic city. And, and, and so just a handful of slides here uh, that talk about that. And I've already uh, used this word connection. Biophilic cities are cities that connect us deeply to the nature around us. And it's very much about uh, bringing nature into buildings and designing buildings that are biophilic and natureful, but it's beyond those buildings as well. It's all of the spaces between the buildings from the room or rooftop all the way out to the region or bioregion and all of the levels in between ideally uh, integrated. Um, so cities that connect us to nature. And it's those nature connections. It's also, uh, we discovered that, that connecting to nature helps connect us to each other. Uh, that's a, nature is a very effective way to facilitate those social connections. Um, our vision of biophilic cities is also one that, that understands the important role that cities have to play today in conservation. Um, we're in the midst of this um, massive global uh, loss of biodiversity. Cities can, can be a partial antidote uh, to that. So our notion of cities are, are, are places, spaces that make room uh, and share space with other forms of life. And that uh, brings in an ethical component um, and, a, and a, uh, a need to coexist in a, and an important role that we, that we make room and we actively uh, work to minimize conflicts, to make spaces with lots of, for lots of other uh, forms of life. Um, they, we benefit greatly um, and, and, uh, and we can contribute to the, the, the conservation challenge, global conservation challenge as well. Birds certainly fit in, into that, that equation also. So if we had to sort of summarize where our partner cities are going in our biophilic cities network and, 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 and how this vision of biophilic cities is, 
is uh, gaining traction. Um, I would say this building is probably a good, a good representation. This is actually a building in Singapore. Singapore uh, is a partner city, one of our first partner cities in the Biophilic Cities Network. And uh, they, for many years, called themselves a garden city. And more recently, they have shifted and, and have been calling themselves a city in a garden. And that's really uh, seems like a little change, but it's profound. And the idea that uh, we don't just want cities where there are places of nature, bits and, and pieces of nature that you visit, you have to walk to the park uh, or to the forest, but rather we want to live in the park. We want the city that is the park, um, a city in the garden, a city in the forest. And increasingly, actually, Singapore is even more uh, assertive and more ambitious in how they're framing their, their, their city, their city state, and calling themselves a biophilic city in nature. And a, a whole variety of uh, impressive planning policies that help to, to bring that about. This is uh, one building, the Park Royal uh, Hotel. Um, in Singapore, there's something called the landscape replacement policy. So whenever you build something like this, you have to at least replace the nature lost at the ground level with the same or more uh, uh, nature in the vertical realm. And so this is a building that actually uh, replaces that ground, ground level nature by more than 200%. You see some of the nature here, it's green roofs and, and sky parks and, and this flowing beautiful um, nature kind of covering the facades. Um, but now there's a friendly competition in Singapore between builders, developers, architects to see which buildings can can um, maximize that ratio that can, can do the most to sort of replace that ground level nature with, with vertical nature. So we say that the vision of a biophilic city is a whole of city uh, approach. So again, room or rooftop, that building scale all the way to region or bioregion and all the, the, the spaces in, in between. And again, envisioning this immersive nature, the city of immersive nature. This by the way is Helsinki uh, on the left um, and a wonderful integrated green spaces network in that city where you can move from the center of this dense city all the way out to old growth forests at the edge of the town of the city. So we know that uh, uh, we spend a lot of our day indoors. We want to bring more nature inside, um, but we also want to propel us outside. And so there's, um, we talk about the sort of matrix of urban nature. So there's an indoor outdoor uh, continuum. We wanna uh, increasingly overcome the barriers too between indoor and outdoor. And here you see, again, the, the continuum of building to, to larger scale uh, region. And on the lower right is, is the ravine uh, system in Toronto. Toronto is our newest uh, partner city. So we want to move again from a, a, a city that sees the nature as a few discrete elements to a complex system. And cities are ecosystems, to be sure. Um, it's also the case that many of the things in a city may not seem to harbor nature, right? Partly this is about reimagining those built spaces as places of, of nature. So here's Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is also uh, officially in our a network and um, their notion of nature is really all of these things, the connection to water, um, parks and, and forest canopy. They're quite proud of their 42% tree canopy cover, but it's also green rooftops and, and designed uh, nature and a wonderful story of the installation of, of swift uh, towers uh, in parks uh, throughout the city and throughout the, the region. So, but looking at this, um, you, you know, we, we wanna look at that bridge, that bridge is, does, wouldn't seem necessarily to be very natureful, but it is a habitat and it could be that there's a peregrine falcon uh, nesting there. So it's a really new kind of way of looking at the city. So we have, I uh, mentioned 24 cities now um, and um, scores of other cities uh, that we're in conversation with, we're hoping to grow this uh, network and to expand it around the world. Um, and uh, we usually get good press when cities uh, join the network. Um, they are required to submit an application that, uh, that talks about the ways in which they are already committed to nature, but also their aspirations 
for the future, they have to adopt uh, and, and monitor a certain number of metrics over time. Um, and they also have to have a council, city council approved resolution or proclamation officially joining the network and aspiring to become a biophilic city. So this is Mayor Peduto, the current mayor of uh, Pittsburgh receiving the certificate as they joined the network. And we had a, a wonderful uh, celebratory event at the Phipps Conservatory uh, there in Pittsburgh. So this is the global map uh, so far, about half our cities are um, North American. Um, and so we're hoping to expand. Um, we only have one Indian city so far uh, and, and a, one in Australia and some discussions with cities in China, uh, but we need, we very much want to expand around the, around the world. So um, there are metrics for thinking about what a biophilic city is. And I will just say, I won't go through this, uh, this graphic, but uh, the main point to make is that there are different ways of thinking about what a biophilic and natureful city uh, is. And it's not just the presence or absence of nature, but it's also the ways in which uh, residents interact with that nature. How much do they care about it? Are they able to recognize a common species of flora and fauna, common species of birds? Um, how much commitment is there from the local government? What percentage of their, their budget goes for the care and, and restoration of, of nature, for, for example? Um, a special importance in our network given to social equity, we know um, in this period uh, where many of the cities in our network have, have this history of systemic racism and segregated land use um, patterns, that there isn't a fair distribution of nature, of, of parks and, and free canopy, for example, or, or experiences of birds. Um, and so this idea of a just and inclusive nature or a just biophilia is a key uh, element in, in, in this vision of biophilic cities. These are images, by the way, of a, a wonderful new park in uh, Portland, Oregon. Portland's been a partner city from the beginning. And we have a, a short um, five minute film about Cully Park on our, our webpage. And it's a park that, isn't, that wasn't designed, it's in a, it's in a neighborhood of color that uh, was underserved, um, uh, didn't have a, a park like this. Um, and then it wasn't just a park designed by the parks department or from, from the top, from uh, the local government, but rather from the bottom up. And so, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the, the garden you see on the lower left, um, those raised beds were, in fact, designed uh, by kids uh, from, from the neighborhood. So we know that um, cities like, this is, these are images from Richmond, Virginia, capital of my, my state. We know that uh, we've got to, to address and, and work on overcoming these profound inequities um, when it comes to, to, to nature. And so Richmond is a wonderful example. Here you have a wild river, the James class four rapids, this wild river, just a few hundred feet from, from a, a very urbanized downtown. Um, but uh, neighborhoods of color uh, not, don't have the same access to that wonderful resource and their uh, tree canopy cover is much lower. Um, and so uh, this is a new plan, new comprehensive plan for the city that's setting some ambitious uh, nature targets um, that are meant to address these inequities. So there's, they will now have a minimum uh, tree canopy cover target, um, and every Richmonder will uh, hopefully be within a 10 minute walk uh, of a park. And um, it's a wonderful story, an emerging story. This is LeVar Stoney, the current mayor of Richmond, and he has made this um, a, a priority. And uh, already, actually in the fall, they have been able to create five new uh, parks in, in neighborhoods of color and places that are underserved with, with parks and uh, basically utilizing land already owned by the city. So it's an emerging story, again, all to say that social equity uh, overcoming systemic racism and, and the, the uh, long-term inequities and the, the kinds of experiences, the kinds of access that neighborhoods of color have had to, to parks and, and trees and birds and all forms of nature. So a um, lot of information on the Biophilic Cities uh, webpage about what our 
our different member cities are, are doing. This is just a, uh, a, a kind of little snapshots of, of what, our, what our, our cities are doing. There's no one model. There's, the cities are, have different opportunities. They have different environmental conditions, different climates. And so what it means to be a, be a biophilic city will be different in, in different places. So now I'm gonna kind of move on um, and talk more specifically about this notion of a bird-friendly city. And here is the cover uh, of, of, the bird, of the book. And so very much I'm seeing um, birds as part of this vision that I've just been talking about of biophilic cities. And so for me, this, is personal, and um, I'm not sure that I would describe myself as a birder necessarily. I don't think I deserve to call myself a birder, but I have been a lifelong lover of birds. And these, by the way, are these are beautiful paintings, images, uh, paintings of a local artist here in Charlottesville, uh, uh, Cynthia Burke. And these are paintings of ours, um, and I, I love the way that they present this the the, the magic of birds, not to, to um, anthrop overly anthropomorphize uh, birds, but they are these magical beings that we co-inhabit space with, with. They are the closest thing to angels here on earth. It's been frequently said by others, I know, but they are a, a delight, a, a, a piece of magic um, that uplift us. And particularly during the pandemic, our so important to our mental health. And it is true that biophilia and biophilic cities are multi-sensory, right? So we're as interested in the experiences of sound. And what are those sounds often in cities? They are the sounds of birds. And those, those sounds animate uh, urban life and we want them there. Um, and here Val Plumwood, uh, um, environmental philosopher, talks about how we need to sort of move from just hearing um, sound to recognizing them as voices. And by the way, this is an Eastern woodthrush, uh, my, one of my favorite spring sounds, and, and I've been kind of keeping track whenever, usually in April, the day that I first hear this. And it, this sound is so enchanting, and it takes me immediately back to my childhood. And it's so place embedding. And I think we underestimate the power uh, of bird song and the power of birds in our lives more, more generally. But we know um, here's the now famous uh, Cornell Lab study. We know there are so many threats and um, this just shocking when this uh, was released a couple of falls ago that we had lost a third of our bird abundance, you know, just, just since 1970. And we know that there's climate change and, and habitat uh, loss and deforestation and, and uh, too much pesticide use and decline in insects and all of these things that may seem very difficult for us to get a handle on or grapple uh, with uh, where we are living. And um, so for me as an urban planner, the, the challenge is what can we do? And we can do a lot. And there are so many ways that we can reimagine cities that will be profoundly more uh, bird uh, friendly. And so we know what um, many of those things are. And uh, so that the book is uh, an attempt to tell the story of the wonderful work going on around the world. Um, here are the volunteers from FLAP. Many of you know about the story of FLAP uh, in Toronto. Michael Mazur, who founded FLAP, um, and this wonderful network of volunteers who started one of the first places where they started actually in a systematic way uh, looking for collecting dead and injured birds during peak migration periods. And, um, and as a, partly as a way of raising awareness. Um, and at that time, there wasn't that much awareness that, that buildings and glass uh, represented serious uh, hazards to birds. Uh, we know, and you all know the estimates that uh, a billion or more, up to a billion, maybe more than that a year, North America or the U.S. Uh, are, are killed from, from bird strikes. We know that birds don't recognize windows as barriers uh, in the same way we do. Perhaps they see the reflected uh, clouds, they see the reflected vegetation. Um, this, by the way, uh, every year they display 
uh, what they've collected, usually at the Royal Ontario uh, Museum, as a as as a way of raising awareness about the seriousness, the magnitude uh, of the problem, and it's pretty striking and pretty effective. A number of cities, a number of other places now do this. Uh, following the example of FLAP and, uh, and Toronto. So we know what we, we can do and should do, and we have wonderful examples, many of them profiled in the book, uh, retrofit stories like the Jacob Javits uh, Center in New York, um, where they you know, essentially replaced their, their glass with bird-friendly fritted glass that can be seen by birds, a remarkable 90-something percent reduction in, in uh, mortality uh, uh, um, for birds, but also, uh, turns out that the building is more energy efficient. So it helps to reduce its energy consumption and its carbon emissions. And by the way, there's a green rooftop that has uh, turned out to be important uh, habitat, important nesting habitat for species in, in the city. So we, we can do so many things when we think about how to design or retrofit the buildings um, in and around cities. We have a number of examples. Um, many of these are profiled on the Biofoot Cities page. Um, in fact, this one, the Frick Environmental Center, we have a new five minute film about it, uh, which is available on our film page on Bioflux Cities. Really interesting story of how the Frick Center worked with a group of high school students to design a kind of DIY uh, paracords uh, system um, on this one side of the building where they were worried about bird, bird strikes. And so for a little bit of money, it became a uh, a project, a community project, and a project to engage uh, kids in understanding the, the hazards. But we have uh, the ability to design new buildings like the, the wonderful new Candida building on the campus of Georgia Tech. This is a, a certified living building under the Living Building Challenge. So it is uh, bird friendly, bird friendly glass, um, but it also uh, produces all the power it needs. It's net zero energy and net zero water. So we've got to, um, you know, that big threat of climate change, we've got to work fast in reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions, our carbon emissions, and that these kinds of buildings will help with that as well, uh, as well as being bird uh, friendly. So uh, another uh, wonderful story is a retrofit of an older building um, in downtown Atlanta. Uh, interface Carpet uh, Headquarters building, affectionately known as Base Camp. And this is a really interesting story. They have um, done many things to make this building biophilic, but one of the most striking features is this series of 307 panels of glass that wrap, um, wrap around the building. There's this transparent, uh, semi-transparent uh, sheath that's essentially a life-sized forest. And uh, birds are able to see that and um, it also has a number of other wonderful qualities for the workers in the building. Um, but it also leads to very interesting architecture. So this is something that people like Michael, Michael Mazur of FLAP is frequently saying, you know, we can, we can design buildings that are profoundly more bird friendly, but they're also gonna be more beautiful. They're going to be more interesting, more visually interesting, like the Aqua Tower in, in Chicago. This is a genie gang design uh, building that is you know, undulating and, and really interesting, but it's a building that has fritted glass and um, is a building that birds tend to see and facades that they tend to see, but it's also a, a really positive addition to the, to the uh, architectural um, world in that city. Other examples, uh, the Ryerson Stu Student Center in, in Toronto Again, a uh, not your typical facade, but one that's really visually, aesthetically interesting and also uh, very bird uh, friendly. Um, I was reminded, there's a shout out uh, to a, uh, a new friend um, that I have, uh, Jim Kuby, who is a volunteer with the Sun City Audubon Club in South Carolina, who, who um, had, had pointed out to me that, you know, it's great to talk about these, these uh, tall buildings and these commercial buildings, but let's not forget about uh, the average home. Let's not forget about suburbia and the single family home. And uh, th that's a huge uh, uh, risk factor for birds and a huge challenge to get uh, homeowners to, to do things. And we, as, as he and others have, have said, there's so many things like the paracords uh, that you can do. This, by the way, is an image from Flap there. Home Safe for Birds, a wonderful um, brochure 
that folds out in a very uh, creative way. But we have, you know, Copian bird savers and bird screens and feather friendly tape and lots of film treatments. And we know there's so many products out there uh, that homeowners could use to make their homes more safe. Okay, very quickly, I'm an urban planner. So I do think one of the themes of the book is that we need to incorporate birds more squarely into the planning that we're doing for cities. And if you looked at these uh, randomly chosen comprehensive plans, these are American cities, you will find almost nothing uh, about birds in them. Almost no reference, if you're lucky to find any reference to, to birds. Um, I think that's got to change. Uh, we have some wonderful emerging examples. One example talked about in the book uh, is Vancouver, where uh, they actually have a, a municipal bird strategy, Vancouver bird strategy. And it lays out a vision for their bird-friendly city. It talks about key opportunities for protecting birds and bird habitat in that city, uh, ways of expanding bird watching and bird-related tourism. Uh, also reviews key challenges that have to be confronted. And in that city, a number of interesting programs, initiatives, policies, including uh, a, a really interesting process that they went through to choose their uh, permanent city bird. And they had thousands of people uh, voting uh, for, their, for the city bird and, it, uh, and, it, and choosing in the end a black cat chickadee that received 75,000 votes, by the way. Um, I do believe that our land use planning in and around cities has to incorporate consideration for birds. We can do this. This is, these are images from Edmonton, our partner city, Edmonton, Canada. Uh, they have been wonderful landscape, connected landscape, ecological connect, connectivity, uh, orientation to the planning that they're doing in their city. They've uh, constructed 27 wildlife passages now and they're uh, imagining their, their city um, in terms of how, how animals move through it, in, including uh, birds. So um, they've done some circuitscape um, modeling using this idea of circuit theory, electric circuits, and the idea of kind of identifying those places that represent um, blockages or, uh, for birds and, and, and trying to overcome them in the, in the planning interventions we, uh, we engage in in cities and the kind of land use planning we do. So more of this kind of work, um, resistance mapping circuit theory would, would be very helpful uh, as well. It's coexistence on the way to co-flourishing. Um, here's just a little bit more about their ecological network um, approach. We have a short film on our webpage about Edmonton's approach to ecological planning, which is really quite wonderful if you have a few minutes to watch that as well. So many other things that we could be doing in cities uh, Vittoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque country in, in, in Spain. Um, this is an example of bringing uh, a stream back to the surface, a, a small river actually that was underground in a pipe, bringing it back to the surface, important uh, ecological uh, habitat, important human habitat, important bird habitat, and it's turned out to, to be a huge a draw for people in this, in this city. Uh, we need more water uh, in cities, um, but what we don't need probably are chlorinated, sterile, energy intensive water features like the one in the upper right. And what you see here is a story of the conversion of that um, sterile cl chlorinated system on the, on the upper right to what has become a native biodiverse wetland. And this is in the middle of a city. This is Perth, uh, Australia, Perth, Western Australia. And we actually have a six or seven minute uh, film about this wetland story, which is really wonderful. And it's um, wonderful uh, habitat for, uh, for birds as well. We have to do everything we can to protect the larger blocks of habitat that we have in cities and, and to uh, restore a habitat where we can throughout the city. Again, uh, on the right, another image of the ravine system in Toronto, which are major movement corridors for, for birds. On the left uh, is a wonderful story, uh, wonderful and bittersweet story actually of a Banksia forest, ancient forest that was threatened by a highway expansion project in, in Western Australia. And there's a whole a chapter about this in the book. And this is Kate Kelly who, who ran one of the nonprofits that helped to stop the highway. And um, some, of the, uh, some of the forest got uh, destroyed uh, but a lot of it has been has been protected, and it's largely a story about protecting habitat for for birds. And one of the stories that 
uh, I tell in the book is um, connected to that to that landscape. This is an this is ancient and, and sacred land for the Noongar people, Aboriginal uh, community in, in that part of Western Australia. Noel Nanap, who's an elder, talks about their totemic um, culture. So each child uh, chooses one or more animals and over their lifetime uh, learns as much as they can about that animal and becomes its uh, steward, its supporter, its advocate. And for Noel, it's the brown's wing uh, pigeon. Uh, so wonderful story there. Well, so many other ways that we could um, be even more ambitious about what a bird-friendly city is. Bird-friendly, just with bio, as with biophilic cities, we're cities that love nature, but it's not just local nature. It's, it's nature that may be more distant. So uh, we believe that biophilic cities and bird-friendly cities need to exert leadership in the larger world. And that might be uh, support for, for conservation of larger intact ecosystems like the boreal forest and how important that is. It might mean that cities along the migration routes of, of birds uh, actually join together. And we're, we're seeing a lot more cities doing uh, city, city diplomacy, city to city treaty making. Um, very interesting. On the left, by the way, is is the what's called the Eastern uh, Wild Way. This is a vision for a connected uh, network of protected lands uh, along the east coast of the U.S. Uh, put uh, something uh, developed by the Wildlands uh, Network. Here's another version of it on the left. I think that uh, cities have to begin to work beyond their borders. And we have lots of positive examples of that. Here on the right, Austin, Texas is one of our partner cities, and they have declared they're going to be a carbon neutral city. And part of that has meant that they are buying carbon credits um, from projects that plant trees that are, that are habitat restorative for birds, uh, but that those projects are outside the boundaries of that city. So cities can show leadership. They can help to propel forward the the biodiversity conservation, the bird habitat uh, conservation that needs to happen beyond uh, cities. Um, there's a chapter about Singapore's efforts to um, return the, the hornbills to the city. Wonderful story of uh, smart nesting boxes that they've used to, to bring this population back. Um, but it's also a story, I started with that discussion of the Park Royal Hotel, that, Wo that Woha design uh, building. Um, we're seeing more of these buildings that are incorporating um, habitat, wildlife habitat, really, and bird habitat into their very design. And in Singapore, the idea that you can uh, design a building that will, uh, again, replace or restore the natural, the nature that might have existed there pre-development, and this is a wonderful hospital in Singapore, uh, KTPH, uh, so many green and biophilic uh, design elements, but they've really defined the goal of this, uh, this hospital as bringing birds and butterflies back. And, and they're measuring the success, evaluating the success of this building by the number of birds that they see on site. And they have one wall of one building where they're keeping a running tally of those birds. You see it here on the, on the right. So um, Cura de Bat, uh, Costa Rica city that is part of our network, um, they are uh, trying to plant uh, native um, pollinators, native plants throughout the city uh, in parks, along uh, sidewalks and roads. And what I really like is, as this Guardian story on the left suggests, the idea of giving citizenship to the, the biodiversity in that community. So the bees, plants, trees, and birds. Um, uh, what, a, what a way to think about a bird-friendly or biophilic uh, city. Um, part of the challenge is, it, challenge is to rethink those spaces for example, around our homes, those turf grass lawns that don't do much for birds. Um, and this is one of our colleagues on the right, Nina Marie Lister, who teaches at Ryerson in, in Toronto. And uh, she has uh, recently gotten into a conflict with the city. Um, Toronto has a tall grass and weeds ordinance. And she uh, planted this wonderful, beautiful, bird-friendly native garden and it violated this ordinance. And uh, it's a longer, longer story, but we've got to, to begin to work on the spaces around our, our houses. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the book about um, 
uh, predation by uh, domestic and feral cats, and that's its own um, story. We have some wonderful uh, examples of things you can do. Here's a rainbow collar, uh, but we know, you know, cities like Portland um, have been uh, uh, doing campaigns to encourage people to keep those cats indoors. But one of the most interesting ideas is, is this idea of a catio or a cat patio. And uh, we filmed um, a, the annual catio tour. And so this is another film that we have available on the web uh, site. And it's a wonderful story of, uh, this is a catio tour, it's like a garden tour. So every year they line up 10 catios and you buy a ticket and that entitles you to move around and visit the different catios and to see what is uh, possible. And so uh, very quickly, I've, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna go through quickly and give you the five second version of the last few slides so we can have time for, for questions. I do believe this is about uh, in, in inserting or highlighting the awe that cities, that one definition of a biophilic city is a city that maximizes moments of awe. And many of those moments have to do with birds. This is the story of Vox and Swifts in, uh, in Portland, another film uh, during September, during the September migration, uh, hundreds of people come each evening to watch the Vox's Swifts um, uh, roost in, in very dramatic fashion. They, they plunge down into the, this chimney of the Chapman School, wonderful story. Um, there is a trend in the direction of incorporating uh, bird uh, spaces into the design of buildings. This is a, a London building that has 54 uh, new um, common swift nesting uh, cavities really as part of a renovation of this building. And we're seeing uh, projects like uh, Kingsbrook in the UK, which is discussed in the book, incorporating um, swift blocks and swift habitat into, uh, into homes, into new homes. This is actually the UK's largest home builder and they have committed to making every new project uh, wildlife friendly and, and especially uh, birds. So we're moving in the direction of rethinking the very nature of habitat. And uh, Joyce Wong, uh, uh, her work, a wonderful work around habitecture, this idea that if all those spaces, those facades could be designed for multiple species, instead of pushing uh, other forms of life away, we, we, we pull them closer maybe, we make room for them and birds uh, especially. Uh, another wonderful example, Aldea, a community in New Mexico where uh, they've been trying to bring back the juniper titmouse and wonderful collective effort to do that. Um, we could be doing much more restoration in bird friendly uh, uh, cities. And uh, we did a, a, a short film about the burrowing owls uh, in, in Phoenix, another Audubon uh, a project and um, a, a chapter about this in the book as well. And here, watch the film. I promise I'm getting to the very end. I do believe that we need to think creatively about having birds, integrating birds into everything that we're doing. And really every school needs to be thought of as a bird habitat, as a bird immersive uh, landscape and bringing birds into STEM and science and, and um, for kind of cultivating the next generation of, of birders and bird lovers and bird enthusiasts. I think from a city planning point of view, we've got to, to change the metrics and change uh, how we judge a good city. And I'm gonna propose that a good city is a city where everyone can see and experience birds and everyone can hear native bird song. That's a metric, a measure of a good city that we don't hear much about. So I'm at the very end and there's the book. And uh, if you're interested, I guess it's a 30% discount um, with if you give the code, what is the code? Webinar, I guess is the code. <laughs> Anyway, lots of resources, other resources, other Island Press books and other films that we've made. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm sorry to have gone a little bit long. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and hopefully we have still a little bit of time for some questions. Well, Tim, that was a fascinating, fascinating presentation and thank you so much for it. I'm sorry you had to pinch it a little there at the end, but. Um. Well, I, I warned you I had too many slides and that's a, a <laughs> typical problem of mine. So I'm sorry about that. I did put in the chat the, uh, the, the website to order the book on the Island Press site. It is a 25% discount. The discount code is Bird City, all one word, Bird City. Um, 
I also have with, uh, with so we're going to do some questions and answers now. Um, if uh, we'll pitch Tim some questions, but if you have some um, that you haven't already asked, please use the chat and let us know. We'll get to as many as we can. I have joining us um, to help facilitate the question and answers Jillian Bell from Audubon, Connecticut. She's Audubon, Connecticut. <laughs> she is not. She is an attorney. She's not a. <laughs> she is uh, Audubon, Connecticut. <laughs> Communities Program Manager. Jillian, thanks for joining us and helping me um, facilitate thanks, Jillian. Yeah. If, Jillian, before we asked Tim some questions, um, was there anything uh, at, that, uh, in, in Tim's presentation today that pertains to the work that you do in Connecticut or Audubon does in, in, in your area or that you're working on? Yeah, definitely. So the bird friendly community, I'll try and say it quickly. Um, the bird friendly community's conservation strategy works to meet birds needs in places that we share with them. Uh, specifically by providing food, shelter, and safe passage in places to raise their young. And in turn, birds offer us a richer, more beautiful, and healthful place to live, as Tim mentioned throughout his presentation. Um, so our priorities here in Connecticut and New York uh, within Bird Friendly Communities are our Safe Passage and, or our Bird Safe um, Buildings campaign, which includes our Bird Safe Glass and Windows um, and Lights Out initiatives. Our Plants for Birds campaign in which we seek to restore native plant habitat for birds um, at communities, community members' homes, in parks with our urban oases program, on school grounds with our school ride habitat program uh, where there's some integration into the curriculum like Tim was just mentioning, um, and beyond. Uh, one tactic that we're currently expanding both here and in New York, um, I say here, I mean Connecticut and in New York, for both Plants for Birds and Bird Safe Buildings is support for our chapters and centers in developing partnerships uh, to further our PROS work. Um, and that PROS stands for Proclamations, Resolutions, and Ordinances. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get those passed to promote our Safe Passage and Plants for Birds initiatives at the municipal and state levels. <laughs> I hope I said it fast enough so that- That's wonderful stuff. Wonderful things that you're, you're working on. And, uh, and I, you know, I, uh, didn't get a chance to talk about light lighting at all, but and lights out programs. But there, you know, there's a lot of that in the book. But uh, um, so yeah, great stuff that you're 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 working on. Thanks. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, you, uh, just real quickly, um, someone okay. asked. They said that okay. the the bird city code that I put in there as the code um, for to get the discount isn't seem to be working. Bird city all one. Um, so you thought it was yeah, different. the one that I have on my slide is webinar, but I don't, um, okay. and I was told that that would continue to work. I think that's right. Um, okay. Without going back to the All right, whoever asked that, please try webinar. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. And we can always uh, check that later, too. If there's okay. To somebody, somebody used Bird City and it did work. So anyway. Oh, we can oh okay. Okay, great. I a question and it was asked a couple of times, so I'll, I'll paraphrase it a couple of different ways. Um, they, they want to know if the Biophilic Cities was open to suburbs or even smaller communities, that program. Yeah, so we have a, a, a range of sizes. We, we have been hesitant to, um, to identify a, or lay out a sort of low, low, lower threshold. I think our smallest community might be 30,000. Um, and um, we'd be open to to any really any size a city we could uh, send me an email we can talk about that um but it's a variety of, of different size cities edmonton is a million you know and i um so the issues are a little bit different you know depending on the, the size of the city but there are so many common issues and concerns and and the whole idea of sharing these tools and in, inspirational ideas for for incorporating nature that, um, yeah, so so suburbs are certainly, it's certainly possible to, to, to have them in our network. Somebody's asking for my email, I'm happy to, it's uh, usually I have a final slide, but Beatley, B-E-A-T-L-E-Y at virginia.edu. So do send me, any, any questions we don't get to, to answering today or comments or, or uh, conversations that you want to start or uh, cities that you, you think would, you know, could possibly want to join the network. Uh, we have a question from Peter who is asking, can you, can you discuss the need for insects for birds and how people deal with those insects? 
Yeah, and I think that that's uh, you know been a lot on our minds a lot, right? That um, uh, with this decline in insect populations and and um, the in the book there's an interview with Doug Tallamy, uh, and he talks ab about lighting, exterior lighting, and the impact on insects. Um, it, it is an ecosystemic challenge for us, right? We want to we want to create the um, conditions where the, the food sources necessary to sustain birds are there. And um, so that means we have to think about, you know, we got to radically reduce the, the, the pesticide use if we can. The shift to neonics, you know, much more toxic uh, for, forms of, of pesticides and herbicides, uh, especially if we're talking about a bird friendly city, um, we need to follow the examples of cities that are uh, prohibiting the use, you know, we don't, we have a uh, control over a lot of public spaces, right? So cities like San Francisco that have uh, have weaned themselves away from applying herbicides on, on parks. That would be a really easy thing um, to do. So we we've got to think about that. We've got to think about lighting. Um, we certainly have to think about native plants, and this is the thing that Doug Tallamy I think makes such a compelling case about that that when you look at what uh, almost every, you know, bird, every species, almost every species trying to feed its, its, its young with caterpillars um, and the remarkable numbers of caterpillars that are needed. And uh, the, the number of caterpillars that'll be supported by a white oak tree, at least a native tree in my part of the world uh, is so much greater than than um, what a non-native uh, tree or non-native uh, bush might might provide. So um, back to that to that admonition to try to shift to, to native um, lawns, native spaces, move away from that that biologically sterile um, Kentucky bluegrass or whatever it is uh, lawn, and to and to do things that will that will create the food sources that will be essential to support birds. <laughs> I was just looking at something about, um, or I was talking to somebody about this earlier today, and it's like 500 and I think 37 different uh, caterpillar species are supported by oaks versus like yeah, four for I mean, there, uh, Doug would say these are those are special. There are big, yeah, uh, 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 super powerhouses. Super <laughs> powerhouses, right? He has a word for it. Is it powerhouse? I forget. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, I think white oaks are his favorite tree too. Uh, we have another question. Are cities incentivized financially to provide green space? Um, the High Line was not welcomed and now it's a top draw for New York City. Yeah, I mean, we know, we have a lot of evidence um, that investing in nature ha has lots of uh, economic returns, right? I mean, we know if you look at a, a, a comparable homes, uh, the one that has trees will, uh, will carry an economic premium. The market system uh, recognizes the the value of nature, right? So, um, and the High Line is an example of, of where it's a double-edged sword. Um, so it, 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 that's right, stimu has stimulated a lot of uh, development around it. Unfortunately, a lot of that development has been luxury housing, and and it's had the effect of increasing the price of housing and displacing uh, residents who were there, the residents of, of the of Chelsea the Chelsea neighborhood. So um, it's a beautiful park. We want more high lines, but on the, on the other hand, we've got to figure out how to, to uh, reduce the unintended consequences, the eco gentrification, as it's sometimes called. And uh, so it's it's complicated, but a absolutely, there are so many, as we I've mentioned, so many ecological services, so so much economic value attached to those ecological services. If you're you know planting more trees and green roofs that cool the, the city, reducing the air conditioning loads, reducing carbon emissions, enhancing air quality, all these things that, you know, uh, cascading benefits. Um, there's a huge positive economic value um, generated by that. Hey, Jillian, why don't you, um, we're getting toward a th our five o'clock threshold. Why don't you queue up a final question for Tim while I say, this has been asked a few times if, uh, if the presentation was recorded and how to watch it or share it later. And it will be um, it will be on the websites of Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York shortly, um, and also our Facebook pages. Um, I don't know when, but usually very shortly after the, after the end of the presentation. Um, 
So Jillian. Sure. Um, we've had a lot of people asking various questions about bird friendly windows um, and what they can do at their homes um, yeah. to make windows more visible for birds. And also if you have any recommendations for folks that get pushed back from people saying it's only for high rise buildings, which is not yeah. true. It's not just for, for high rise buildings. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I mentioned uh, Jim Kuby, this um, Audubon, uh, South Carolina um, friend who, who, new friend, new acquaintance, who's done, who's done a really interesting little uh, guide, guide to the products out there for your homes. And I don't know if you could make that available, but I think, think if he'd be willing to share it, um, it's, it's a wonderful resource. You, may, you probably, Audubon probably has a I would imagine resources like that, but um, this is nice because it summarizes the, you know, there are, co there are copian um, bird savers and, and um, systems that use fish line and, and um, you know, as I mentioned, there's so, so many, it seems like um, there's commercial different tapes products. Tapes you can use. Tapes like you can friendly. use, as long as you get the, the density right, right? We want the, we want that, we don't just want decals, which we know don't right. work. We want, that two uh, by we four. want the density. We want the squares. We want the the two inch by two inch uh, pattern density, um, yeah. and and at least, and uh, and so the the paracords I think are are a wonderful um, example, a wonderful option for people. You know, relatively inexpensive. You can many of these systems you you can buy the the raw material and and make them yourselves. Um, I don't know what to. To say about how to convince people, I think that um, it, you know it, it's hard to um, when you experience uh, as as um, as many have you know a bird hitting a window. I mean, it's 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 emotionally traumatic and a convincing. You know, and I, I think it's hard to fully understand the magnitude. We don't we don't have good numbers, right? And and um, I think it probably is true that 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 there uh, so many more birds are, are killed or injured uh, than we realize. And uh, I think it's partly, you know, there's so many things about home ownership, so many things about basic citizenship um, that we are expected to do or, or ways that we are expected to behave. If you're, you know, if you're part of a homeowners association, you know, you have to do certain things and be a good neighbor. Well, maybe this is part of what, how we ought to re rethink citizenship in a way. What it means to be a good citizen or a good homeowner means that you have an ethical obligation to, um, you know, do everything you can to minimize the dangers for birds. I don't think it's probably high on m most, you know, most homeowners lists of things to do, but I, I think we've got to really start to tackle that. I showed that image from FLAP and they've, they have a, uh, as I mentioned, this um, program, this campaign kind of aimed at, at single family homes or homeowners or residential, I guess is, is the, probably the white, right category. Um, and I think going to the Flap, FLAPS webpage, you'd find a lot of wonderful material and resources that might help in convincing neighbors, talking to, to your neighbors about what they, what they could do or what you could all do together. You know, I think that would be a really interesting way to do it. Tim, thank you so much. It was, uh, you know, we had many dozens of questions. We're not going to get to them all. If anyone has a burning question, you can email it to Audubon Connecticut or Audubon New York, and we'll uh, we'll pester Tim indefinitely until he answers all of our questions. <laughs> happy to. No, happy to. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us, Jillian. Thanks so much for coming and, and assisting here at, um, on this presentation. Sure, um, and and uh, before we sign off, I just want to tout our presentation next month. We'll be on March 17th. Um, Author and ornithologist Ken Kaufman will be joining us to talk about the geography of migration to get us all excited about the uh, forthcoming spring migration ahead of us. So um, thanks again, Professor, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Everyone for joining us.